So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure for me to be invited to speak on this complex topic in front of such a distinguished audience. Um, whether I'm an expert on genetic resources or not, that stays on another paper. So let's see what I can bring you or I can enlighten you um, on this particular matter that is now being discussed, or at this moment is being discussed in New York. Um, I will, in my presentation, I will touch upon six topics. First of all, I would like to be, I would like to give a brief introduction of the organization that I'm working with, the IUCN. Then I would like to provide some background information about areas beyond national jurisdiction and marine genetic resources, the topic that I have to speak to you. Third, an introduction on a new international legally binding instrument that is being negotiated at the moment. Uh, fourth, the, complete, the competing principles at issue in this negotiation on the international legally binding instrument, and finally, a practical approach that we would like to propose for tackling the several matters that are at issue in this international legally binding instrument. So with your permission, I would like to pass a little commercial about the IUCN the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Because some of you might know who the IUCN is, some of you might not know. I'm not going to take too much time. Just to tell you that this organization, which is um, a membership-based international organization, uniquely composed by states, state agencies, and non-governmental organization, was created in 1948 and has evolved over the years into what it could be considered the world's largest and most diverse environmental network in the world. Uh, this organization harnesses the experience, the resources, and the reach of its members, approximately 1,300, which include states and non-state members and also the input of approximately 13,000 experts in its various commissions, ranging from species survival all the way to environmental law. IUCN could be considered, and this is not something that I'm saying, but the experts say, as a global authority on the status of the natural world and the measures needed to safeguard it. For example, you will probably know the red list of, an, of, of, of endangered species, which is one of the prime products that is produced by our organization. Now, turning the page to my office, the Environmental Law Center, which belongs to the IUCN, um, briefly, this organization was established in 1970 in the city of Bonn, when Bonn was still the capital of the divided Germany. Uh, probably we were one of the first international organizations in the city of Bonn. Now Bonn is a huge hub for international organizations and primarily dealing with the environment and sustainable development. The work of the Law Center is not only on genetic resources, so we have what we can say or, or summarize in four fundamental pillars of work being one of them, the conceptual development of environmental law at the national and at the international level as a distinct discipline. So the IUCN Environmental Law Center has initiated several discussions on multilateral environmental agreements, such as the Convention on Migratory Species, the CITES Convention, more recently, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and now we are engaged in the discussions on the supplemental agreement on BBNJ. Second pillar of work is the assistance, 
primarily to developing countries in designing and implementing the legal frameworks for the protection of the environment at the national as well as at the international level, um, strengthening capacities for environmental law. So during lunch, we were discussing with the, with the two ladies that, 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 that were presenting before the importance of capacity building. It looked like as if it were something very much related to the implementation of the Rio Conventions in the 90s, but now we realize that capacity building remains a fundamental topic for all of those that are dealing with environmental law at the international level, and it is a fundamental vehicle for ensuring implementation. And finally, the dissemination of legal knowledge and information. We are the custodians and the management unit of ECOLEX, which is the gateway to environmental law. It is a comprehensive global database on environmental law jointly implemented with UN Environment and FAO. And that's it about UCN. <clears throat> now, let's start, I would say, with some basic definitions, because I don't think, I tell you quite frankly, when I was invited to speak here about BBNJ and um, genetic resources specifically, I was really struggling the way in which I should organize my presentation I hope that I can, at least, I can at least trigger some discussions in this, in, in this audience and by way of enlightening uh, around the main issues that are being discussed at the moment in New York. But let's start first with what are areas beyond national jurisdictions. And allow me to put <clears throat> this picture about the maritime zones that you all know better than me. We have the territorial seas, we have the exclusive economic zone, we have the continental shelf, we have the high seas, we have the area. The area and the high seas are considered areas beyond national jurisdictions. And one of the main issues is that this division that you can see in this graph of the ocean into jurisdictions is not based on science, but on political compromises. From an ecological perspective, it does not make sense to draw a jurisdictional boundary at the 200 nautical miles or between the seabed and the water column. These areas are highly connected and many species pass back and forth between them. For example, a species may spend part of its life cycle on the seabed and part of its life cycle in the water. And many fish populations straddle the 200 nautical miles boundary or migrate back and forth. With that in mind, let's have a look at the map showing the areas beyond national jurisdiction. This map shows that approximately two thirds of the world oceans lie beyond national jurisdictions, almost half of the planet. Areas beyond national jurisdictions are of key importance for food security, for carbon capture, for scientific research, and so on and so on. But then, what are marine genetic resources? And I know that in the audience, are experts on that, are PhDs, uh, people, you know, are PhDs, authors in the audience that I hope they can help me to enlighten you if I make some mistakes in my appreciation on those issues. What are marine genetic resources? The high seas and the deep seabed contain some of the most extreme environments on the planet. Species have evolved in those areas <clears throat> to live in conditions of extreme heat, cold, salinity, pressures, darkness. Sometimes you see species that look of a science fiction a film. And these species may have unique DNA that can be medically and scientifically important and certainly commercially valuable. And that's why 
we are discussing marine genetic resources here. Now let's turn to the question of why there is a need for an agreement in this area. The, there are many legal instruments, as we discussed yesterday and today, related to global oceans governance, as you can see on this slide. UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and Related Instruments, FAO Related Agreements, IMO Related Agreements and Standards, UNEP Regional Seas Conventions, others like CAMELAR, Arctic Treaty Systems, Species Specific Conventions, and so on and so forth. So then, why do we need a new instrument? Because there is a fragmented coverage that is not comprehensive. Again, the issue of fragmentation that floats around this conference. The current coverage is fragmented, focusing on specific regions, specific species, specific sectors like fishing, like shipping, etc. As we have seen in the list, there are many legal instruments related to global oceans governance, but this is too fragmented. Also, current organizations do not have a comprehensive mandate and do not always coordinate with each other, and some regions and some sectors do not have an applicable entity. Second, there are weak regional or sectoral organizations. Different regionals, different sectoral organizations have different levels of capacities some are less able to address these multiple problems and challenges. Third, cumulative impacts. Sectoral activities that are regulated separately have cumulative impacts on biological diversity, and coordination is therefore absolutely necessary to address these impacts that accumulate. And finally, gaps, because emerging issues are not currently covered by the instrument. For example, access and benefit sharing in relation to marine genetic resources in areas beyond national jurisdiction. This is more or less the timeline of the development of an international legally binding instrument on marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction, starting from 2006, going with this ad hoc open-ended informal working group that had nine sessions between 2006 and 2015. In 2012, very important, in Rio Plus 20, the states committed themselves to address on an urgent basis the issue of the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction, including by taking decision on the development of an international instrument. In 2015, the General Assembly in Resolution 69-292 asked to convene the session of a preparatory committee and had four sessions between 2016 and 2017. And in 2017, through the resolution 72-249, asked to convene an intergovernmental conference. This intergovernmental conference, which is at the moment taking place, will have held four sessions between 2018 and 2020. So we are dealing with an issue that at the moment is being discussed. So there are no fundamental definitive answers on the matter, as far as I can see. Therefore, what I'm going to propose is the topics for discussions. So the negotiations on BBNJ are always structured in four topics, and cross-cutting issues are is included into the discussions at the end of every session. These four topics are the ones that you can see on the slides, 
environmental impact assessment, capacity building and technology transfer, area-based management tools, and marine genetic resources. Why environmental impact assessment? Because this topic relates to the conduct of activities in areas beyond national jurisdictions that may cause substantial pollution or significant harm to the marine environment in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Different questions were raised, such as the kind of activities that will trigger an environmental impact assessment, or who will make the final decision, or who will carry out the assessment, or what is the effect of the final decision on the EIA. These are fundamental questions that are part of the negotiations at the moment in New York. Second, capacity building and transfer. How will capacity building be coordinated? How will capacity building be funded? Let's turn into area-based management tools. For example, MPAs, for example, no-take zones. One of the main issues is to define what are these area-based management tools? And to identify, for example, how marine protected areas will be managed and enforced and how they will be established in the high seas. Finally, marine genetic resources, which is the topic that we are focusing on. In the discussions on marine genetic resources, how I am with the time, Alexander? Am I okay? Okay, thank you. In the discussions on marine genetic resources, there, are, there is, I would say, a practical aspect and an abstract aspect. And this is my proposal, as I said, to bring to your attention. The abstract aspect is to know how to reconcile two competing principles. The principle of the freedom in the high seas and the principle of common heritage of mankind. And the practical aspect is to know how to practically manage genetic resources and share the benefits deriving them from without blocking scientific progress. These two sections that come now will try to address these two questions. The central tension in the question of governance of marine genetic resources is between the principle of freedom of the high seas and the common heritage of humankind. Let's first look at the principle of common heritage of humankind. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, I know that you know that, but let me repeat that because I think the devil is in the detail, and this is exactly what we need to consider if we would like to discuss about this matter, provides that the area and its resources are the common heritage of mankind, in Article 136. The area is defined as the seabed and the ocean floor and the subsoil beyond national jurisdiction. However, the resources are defined for this section as mineral resources. And therefore, what does this mean for genetic resources? Are they included in common heritage of mankind? I think this is a valid question because some states argue that biological resources are not explicitly excluded, and so the area should be interpreted as to include them. Other states claim that because resources is specifically defined as to cover only mineral resources in the area, the scope of common heritage cannot be applied to other type of resources. Therefore, in a nutshell, common heritage of mankind under the Convention on the Law of the Sea means that the marine resources of the area do not belong to anyone, a state, a natural, or a judicial, or a judicial person, but to mankind, to everyone. Therefore, the benefits from the resources governed uh, by common heritage of mankind should be equitably shared 
with everyone, mankind. The International Seabed Authority is the organization or will be the organization in charge of controlling that this principle is respected. Now, the principle of the freedom of the high seas. Either the Convention on the Law of the Sea, the high seas are governed by the principle of freedom of the high seas. This includes, as you know, but let me repeat, the freedom of scientific research and means that the states are free to conduct activities in the high seas but cannot interfere with the freedom of other states to exercise this freedom. Many states argue, and this is also part of the negotiations, that genetic resources fall under the freedom of the high seas. They argue that the principle of freedom of the high seas applies explicitly to the water column. In addition, they would include living resources of the area as they are not explicitly included in common heritage of mankind. However, it is important to note that the freedom of the high seas, as you know, is not an unconditional freedom. It is limited by the conditions laid down by the Convention on the Law of the Sea, including strong obligations to protect and preserve the marine environment and to have due regard to the rights and respect to the activities in the area. So what do we do with this mess? These two competing principles give rise to a number of questions that I would like to consider in this conference. Are genetic resources in the area governed by the principle of common heritage of mankind? If they are not, are they instead governed by the principle of freedom of the high seas? Or are genetic resources in the high seas governed by the principle of freedom of the high seas? And if not, could they be governed by the principle of common heritage of mankind? And if the Law of the Sea Convention is not clear, and this is the key question, can an implementing agreement define a new regime for these resources? To answer these questions, it is possible to say that at first, having a different regime for the area and a different regime for the high seas would be unworkable. Secondly, the regime for marine genetic resources in areas beyond national jurisdiction needs to work in tandem with a regime applying within national jurisdiction under the Nagoya Protocol on access to genetic resources and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from their utilization. So what kind of system do we want? What is needed? There is, in the negotiations <clears throat> at the moment, a growing consensus of what will be needed to effectively manage or to effectively have a regime for managing these genetic resources in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And these include facilitation of access to marine genetic resources and promote research that will benefit humanity. Enabling the participation of all states, including developing countries. Ensuring sharing of non-monetary benefits, including sh sharing research results and scientific data and involving developing country scientists in research. Consider an option for sharing of monetary benefits and providing at the end of the day legal certainty. Possibly most important, there is a need for clarity about the legal status and the obligations relating to marine genetic resources. What could this all look like? There are different ways to realize this type of system in the agreement. One general proposal would include, for example, a requirement that research cruises 
file a pre and a post cruise report, including information on where research was conducted and what genetic materials were accessed and where they are deposited. Developing countries, researchers should have opportunities to participate in those cruises, possibly for a requirement that certain number of research places be made available specifically for researchers from developing countries. Meta, metadata pardon, relates to, relate to samples such as where they were collected, when and by whom should be attached to the samples and should stay with them and be disclosed in any publication or in any patent application. Samples should be deposited in biorepositories <clears throat> and there should be opportunities for other scientists, including from developing countries, to access the samples and associated data for their own research. There could be a small payment at the time of patenting or licensing, which would go into a global fund to be used for purposes of marine science, conservation, capacity building, and supporting the agreement. And information from cruise notifications, opportunities for joining cruises, data relating to samples, and funds available could be shared through a cleaning house mechanisms. I'm concluding. So, sovereignty versus freedom at the end of the day. After these developments, we can possibly, I would say possibly conclude and certainly pose the question in comparing the challenges ahead of international governance of biodiversity within national jurisdiction with those challenges ahead of international governance of biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Within national jurisdictions, international governance of biodiversity is related to the sovereignty of states, while beyond national jurisdiction the governance of biodiversity at the international level is related to the freedom of states. In addressing biodiversity laws within national jurisdictions, we often face challenges related to state sovereignty, which does not let the global community, so to say, just to dictate protection measures, the response to these challenges, sovereignty challenges, is certainly consent. States express their consent via international agreements. In addressing biodiversity laws in areas beyond national jurisdiction, the central challenge is not related to state sovereignty, but to their freedom, the freedom of the high seas. No one has jurisdiction no one on everybody has rights. One of the fundamental then remaining question is to know how do we control at the end of the day the activities where states have no jurisdiction? The answer could be that states have responsibility over activities within their jurisdiction or control and these activities could be activities carried out by vessels flying their flags or activities carried out by the nationals, and there are countless examples in Article 94, in Article 139, in Article 213 and 219. But these are the main questions at the moment being discussed when this agreement is being negotiated in New York, and with these questions, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you very much.